Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. And Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. And, of course, it is brought to you locally by our friends at PropSwap, America's sports betting marketplace. Sell your sports bet, take your profit, find out how. Go to PropSwap.com or download the PropSwap app today. Andrew DeCecco is here. We're going to take a look at some of the championship round matchups. He has his mock draft up now, and I want to get into that with him as well over at InsideTheBirds.com as he joins me for another edition of Football at Four here on the Sports Bash. Andrew DeCecco, what's going on, man? Hey, Mike. How's it going? All is well. I know uh, we got uh, some games to talk about. It's our last week to get multiple games in, so let's kind of uh, get the breakdown from you on what you're watching. Let's go with the AFC game first, because Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, this is obviously the best quarterback uh, battle of the two games this weekend. I want to start with Burrow and kind of let the listeners in from your opinion. You know, he was coming out in the draft, what you thought about him, and what kind of pro, what makes Joe Burrow uh, I guess we can kind of put him in. He's he's leaning towards or trending towards being an elite quarterback in his league. He is, and the reason why is because he had he came in the NFL with a mature and refined skill set and the demeanor that you need to be a franchise quarterback in the NFL. And he's built for sustained success because he's coming from a. a a pro offense and he has he's thrown to so many different prolific receivers in his career there and he's seen a lot of football and he's unfazed by the moment and you're seeing him really elevate the offense because the Bengals have had pieces remember over the years but it took the right quarterback to be able to elevate the offense and take it to the next level and he's been able to do so and he continuously has has gotten better each week and more comfortable leading the offense. And, you know, this game isn't going to be too big for him. However, I think the X factor in this game is going to be Frank Clark from the Chiefs and him, his ability to just wreak havoc against a Bengals offensive line that just surrendered, I believe it was nine sacks last week. So that to me is the story within the story going into this because I don't think the Bengals are going to have problems scoring points at least in the passing game, actually in the running game or the passing game, but it's a matter of is he going to have enough time to unleash the football to his prolific wide receiver core and allow them the ability to, to sort of run free against that secondary that is very vulnerable. You know, we got Burrow here, and you take a look at the weapons he has. I was critical, and I don't remember where you stood on draft day. They took Chase. That has worked out, so I guess you could say, Mike Gill, you were wrong on that. But I thought it was imperative that there was an offensive lineman, Penay Sewell, that was available, Slater available, and they passed on him. Um, but talk about what Chase adds with the other receivers. Because the part of it was, well, Chase is good, but they've got some other guys. But why does this offense work with the three of them so well? Well, I was among the many that, or, or at least I know that I was among the, the folks that said that Penny Sewell probably should have been the pick at three, giving their offensive line woes and a quarterback coming off of an injury. I thought you need to protect your assets. That said, it's really hard to sort of disagree with their decision to go with a Jamar Chase who has really taken that offense and amplified it to the nth degree as far as just being able to take the top off of defenses, be dynamic in open space, just be a reliable check down option that can, that can turn a play into a 60 yard touchdown. And the offense really needed that, that big play threat to complement T Higgins, who T Higgins, by the way, would be a number one receiver on a lot of offenses out there. I thought that Jamar chase adds an explosive dimension that wasn't quite there. Tyler Boyd is the, is the, the, the missing link to that trio and that he's the, the reliable slot receiver that can do a lot more things than just your prototypical 10 yard, catch it, move the chains type of guy. I think that he offers uh, vertical ability and he's a tough guy and he's going to catch the ball in traffic. So there's a, they all sort of blend together very well and their skill sets really complement each other. 
But it all starts with Jamar Chase, who has all pro upside. And I think that he's going to be a player that really is going to be a, a prominent uh, factor in the NFL for years to come. Uh, their offensive line. They didn't take Soul. They didn't take Slater. They went with what they had. They got sacked nine times. In this game, you mentioned Frank Clark, Andrew. Will this be the week that the, the lack of addressing of the offensive line will finally catch up to them? Yeah, in, in all likelihood, yeah. I mean, all things even, I think that the Bengals could have stood to, toe-to-toe with the Chiefs if they had a couple of components on their offensive line that could withstand the the pass rush of the Chiefs. However, you saw last week that it's really hard to have a functional offense if you have a porous offensive line. Now, Joe Burrow, we just mentioned that he's in the elite category, so he's able to, to sort of uh, alleviate some of those, some, some of that pressure and make plays on his own, but there's not a lot of quarterbacks that can overcome that. And I think this week, going against a team in the Chiefs, they can score at will. As you saw with Buffalo, your margin for error is so small that you need to almost score at every possession. And I think that there's going to be too many instances where the Bengals give up too much pressure, drive stall, you're, you're kicking field goals instead of punching it in for touchdowns. And I, I think that the Bengals are going to be able to pull, or the, the Chiefs, rather, are going to be able to pull away fairly easily because of that deficiency that the Bengals have. Um, let's, uh, I think everybody looks at Chase, Burrow, and that offense. How about that Bengal defense? Uh, why are they, uh, you know, what they did last week? I think they, it gets downplayed a little bit about what their defense brought to the table last week to be able to win that game for them. Well, they're a young, tough, aggressive, fast-flowing defense that's really – that really has a lot of homegrown talent. They, they've done things the right way quietly, right? They're not a team outside of this year that's really been known to have a lot of building blocks or known for having a, uh, a front office that builds teams in the, in the long-term mindset of, you know, being a viable contender uh, for, the, for the postseason because that just hasn't they, – they haven't factored into that equation. But, I mean, you have to really like – I mean, Jesse Bates – is one of the best young safeties in football. Doesn't get talked about enough. I'm pretty sure they're going to find a way to keep him in house this off season and not let him get out. Uh, Logan Wilson is a linebacker who I was really high on in the draft. Made a key play last week on an, inter- on an interception that was uh, deflected that he came down with to really set the Bengals up to win that game. And you know they just have a lot of pieces there. I think the pass rush could stand to be improved. I think they're a little uh, injury-prone and, and light in those areas, and I don't know if they have the horses to to get after Mahomes because you're gonna, you know, it's gonna be a hurry-up offense, and they're gonna have to shuffle guys in and out of the lineup. The Bengals just, flank, frankly, don't have the personnel right now to really contend with that. But I, I think that you know, if, if they're able to refine and then fortify the trenches on the offensive line and defensive line in the draft, they're gonna be set up to be an AFC contender for yep. years to come, the Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah, that's been – I think, Andrew, of all the stories in these playoffs, the Bengals' emergence has uh, really kind of grabbed me. I know it's the quarterback play and these great games and these great finishes, but to me it's something more subtle. is a, a demoralizing 30-year of seasons for Cincinnati is finally giving some optimism entering the season. Now, they had a nice run with Dalton – um, so I guess it's it, it, they haven't been Detroit Lion esque, but it's been a pretty rough thirty years in Cincinnati, and it finally feels that they're coming out on the other side. And who knows, Andrew? They could be you know the new Indianapolis Colts, the new uh, New England Patriots, the new Pittsburgh Steelers, where those teams were consistently in play for Super Bowls because of who their champ their quarterback was at the beginning of the year. Absolutely, they've they've completely reshaped their their storyline and and their uh, I guess their long term viability. And I, I feel I have to say this: I, I feel really I'm really happy for the fans in Cincinnati. I'm someone who years ago I really liked to travel and check out different stadiums and things like that. I went to Cincinnati, fell in love with the city, really loved the the, you know, the old Paul Brown Stadium and. The, the whole, the way that the, the city, the, the, the main street there shuts down and they have, you know, DJs and all this stuff going on. And the fans were there. They turned out, no matter how bad the team was, they, stood, they stuck with it and they, you know, they believed in, in the process, so to speak. So, I mean, just being able to chat with them and, and talk, talk some history with them and uh, you, you feel really happy for them. And they're now set up to be 
talk about the AFC and, and how they have some some big time quarterbacks and well they they got a good one and they have a, a, a strong foundation there and they're going to be a force to be reckoned with for years to come. Um, let's look at the Chiefs because uh, they're in this game for the fourth straight year. Mahomes only got to do it under what twenty seven years old, so he's obviously. Uh, I think making his mark as the next big guy. Uh, my question really is they have Mahomes, but what about the core around him? How long is this group going to be special? Um, well, I, I think that they're going to be capped as far as what how special they can be because it, you can only afford to keep so many different guys in house. I mean, Tyreek Hill, is is going to break the bank. You have Travis Kelsey, who's getting a little, quietly getting a little bit up there in age and getting a little long in the tooth. But I, I mean, you, you need you need to add some more wide receiver, some more explosive wide receivers. I think to that offense, and they they're but you know keep in mind that they're doing all this without a bona fide stud running back, three down running back, and a strong complementary option to Tyreek Hill as a wide receiver and um, you know, I think they'll be able to keep it going as long as Patrick Mahomes stays healthy and, and, and Travis Kelsey remains in the prime of his game. But, you know, they could definitely start this should start to stockpile some young talent there because they have a quarterback in Patrick Mahomes that has, is a generational talent. And I think you want to sort of capitalize on that while, while you can. Yeah. Um, all right. They had a, ter- a horrendous defense early in the season. Uh, where are they defensively now? Well, it still is, uh, right? I mean, I mean, like that's still their, it's, that's still the glaring blemish on their, that, that's going to hold them back as far as you know. I think long term, that that's really where they're they need to retool that that area in order for them to year in and year out be able to contend and compete. Because remember, earlier in the season, they looked like a team that was very much on the ropes, and not many people really knew what to make of them and, or, or even if they were going to be able to, to outlast a team like the Buffalo Bills because their defense was so putrid in that regard. So um, they can be exposed in the passing game, and I think it will. I think Joe Burrow and, and company will be able to find success going through the air. And against the running game, in, against the run, they're going to get gouged. I mean, they have a couple of players that are good and decent building blocks, but they don't have a lot of long-term options or long-term fixtures that they can really move forward with. So I think that that needs to be the area where they really start to revamp and, uh, you know, to find some, to find that balance where you can play complimentary football because they're going, they're, they're asking Mahomes in the offense to be able to have to score 35 plus, you know, a game really to, 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 to hang in there. Hey, people forget these two teams played not long ago. Kansas city looked like they were dominating, but the Bengals went toe to toe and they scored with them. They went toe-to-toe offensively. So we'll see how round two of Bengals-Chiefs goes. You can hear that game Sunday on 97.3 ESPN. Uh, we'll get Andrew's pick on that game in just a bit. Let's flip over to the NFC. San Fran, the Rams. San Fran has owned this series. They just played three weeks ago. San Fran down 17. They came back, win that game. They don't win that game. They're not even here. Uh, you, I, This is an interesting one for me, Andrew, because – San Francisco just ha- they almost feel like that Eagles underdog team that everybody ah they don't have the quarterback you know this that and then you have the Rams who it's now or never if they don't win this year they might be out of luck for a while with no draft pick so um, and, and then you got the San Francisco that they've owned this series what is the key match in this particular one that interests you the most the 49ers defensive line versus the offensive line. Um, of the Rams because I want to see how Matthew Stafford responds to pressure. I mean, we saw him answer the bell last week, but I want to see how he responds to pressure bearing down on him. You're one game away from the Super Bowl. There, you're, you're, everything you're doing right now is looked at under a microscope, knowing that the, the Rams invested so much in bringing you in for the sole purpose of you being the guy to get them over the hump. I want to see how he answers because right now they're clearing away, in my opinion, at least the better team this week. Now it's can he deliver when they need him the most? Because I think the defense will be able to do it just fine, but they're not going to be able to. I mean, they have a, the Niners and the Rams. They've they've had their back and forth this year, so they know each other very well. And I sort of want to see that that chess match with Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay and how that's going to play out. It's not going to be a. I imagine it's going to be a slugfest. I don't think the Rams are going to win this going away by any stretch, but 
uh, that's going to be the game within the game, the defensive line with Aaron Donald and, and, and company versus the offensive line and vice versa. Um, I, I want to get your opinion on Stafford. Uh, there was a lot of questions entering the playoffs on him. Um, are they winning because of Stafford? Has he done enough to say, you know what, this guy's a, you can win a Super Bowl because of Matthew Stafford. Are we at that point now? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I think he's been as advertised, right? I think he's been a guy that that's going to command the offense, maximize the weapons. I mean, it helps to have a Cooper Cup there and an Odell Beckham. But I mean, he's how many times we've we seen offenses that have had talent that have had talent but can't maximize it. I think he's helped them take it to the next level that Jared Goff couldn't do, and I think he's really acclimated quite well to Sean McVay's offense and taking it to the next level and now he is he is a quarterback that you could feel comfortable with command leading your offense into the super bowl and and even winning a super bowl circumstances are ideal for him right now granted but i think that he's answered a lot of questions and checked off a lot of boxes this year as far as can he be the guy to, to do that or is he more of a, just a middling quarterback that that isn't going to be able to ever taste the super bowl i think that yeah, he very much can, and I think that it's all in all likelihood he will be in the Super Bowl. Uh, I am rooting for anarchy, Andrew. I want to see Jimmy Garoppolo win the Super Bowl and then make them have to make a decision uh, on what to do with him. That's what I'm cheering for. What is the matchup that uh, you are rooting for? Uh, in this particular game or just over the overall? Oh, no, okay, I'm going to go. I would like to see San Francisco because I want the Rams thing to fall on their face and then have to go through – drafting hell for the next five years. That would make me happy. So I want San Francisco. I kind of want to see, I, as much as I think the Bengals story is cool, I do want to see greatness. So I want to see Mahomes get another one and have him be like, you know, I got to grow up with Brady and watch that. And, and I want to see Mahomes be like the next Brady where he's just piling these things up. As long as, and, and, you know, he doesn't have to get every one, but I want him to be the one. I could see that. Well, I want the 49ers to win because I have family out there in San Francisco, so I'm thrilled for them that they're gonna that, that they have uh, something to look forward to this weekend. Obviously, I'm a big Debo Samuel fan. He's my favorite player in the NFL to watch. Just a dynamic talent. And then on the other side, I, it's it's pretty clear with me. I, I would love to see the Cincinnati Bengals be able to get to that Super Bowl. I mean, what a great story! Just and and it's a story in which they it took time and patience to build. Zach Taylor was a coach that many wanted to run out uh, at the first sign of any sort of uh, potential collapse. I mean, they, they, he hung in there. He did things his way. He got his quarterback. The offense is, is humming right now. And like I said, I, I, have a, I had a good rapport with a good experience with the fans when I've been there multiple times. So um, I think that that's a great story. And I'm looking to, I, I hope that they're able to pull it off this week. All right, over at InsideTheBirds.com, Andrew DeCecco has his first Eagles mock draft up, 1.0. We're three months out, but Andrew and I uh, can probably fill four hours talking draft. Now, you went more than just round one. You went the whole kit and caboodle here. Let's start with number 15. We'll we'll kind of go through the first round. You're going Linderbaum, offensive lineman, which is kind of interesting after yesterday's news with Brandon Brooks, obviously out, uh, retiring. Uh, so it does kind of put offensive line as a spot that they might have to consider now. Yeah, and I have to say that I'm I'm pleased with the reaction for the most part. People seem to really like the mock draft, so uh, there'll be all that draft content exclusively on InsideTheBirds.com. But yeah, uh, he's he's a player that I could totally see the Eagles going with. Obviously, Howie Roseman and, and the Eagles' philosophy. They haven't been shy about their notion to really. I uh, want to build the trenches, and that's really where the game is won. So I, I could definitely see them doing that. I think he also offers potential to play guard as well, but I think his long-term features fixture is going to be at center. Plays a lot like Jason Kelsey. There's a lot of similarities in their game, so I could totally totally see the match there, and it wouldn't surprise me if they went that way. All right, 16, the very next pick, uh, Edge, Trayvon Walker. It's very You're going very Howie Roseman-esque here, offensive line, defensive line. Well, it's not just Howie Roseman. As it, it's really where their deficiencies lie, and they are looking at their defensive line. They need help. Um, remember, Ryan Kerrigan and Barnett are going to hit free agency. They're probably not going to be there. Brandon Graham's coming off injury, and Josh Sweat um, is the only guy that you can really count on moving forward. So I think that that is a no-brainer. I think if they had their druthers, 
George Karloffis would be the pick, but I don't think he's going to be there. So I have him going with, with the next best option. And I think he offers inside outside versatility. Uh, he's weighs 275 right now, but I think that he has the frame. He's 6'5". Remember, he can get up into the 300s and play inside if they need him to. But just a versatile player with an athletic skill set um, that I think is going to be a game wrecker. Last one in the first round is Roger McCreary, corner. They have not done well in this spot before, uh, but it's evident that they've got to get a guy there. I mean, Nelson's a free agent. They got McPherson and all these uh, merry men. Uh, they took McPherson in the fourth round. But they really, if they don't bring Nelson back, uh, it doesn't seem that they have a really good option again across from Slay. Yeah, they sure don't, because then you're looking at Devontae Maddox, which we know is a slot corner, and then you have Zach McPherson and Craig James and a couple of other younger players there. So, they no, they don't have a viable option. So I think right now, with the way I looked at it is there's such a big drop-off if you wait until the second round to grab a corner. Roger McCreary, to me, is someone who I think that he's going to see his stock rise in Mobile. I saw a couple of people comment that, you know, 19 is a little high for him. Well, that's totally that's totally inaccurate. But he is a player that is going to be a factor in that area. And, you know, you never want to – another thing is you never want to speak in absolutes when you're talking about the draft. Certainly not when you're talking about three weeks – three months out. But he's a player that I really will – I really do think is going to see his – his stock skyrocketed after a week in Mobile. Long corner from Auburn. Really gives a physical presence on this, on uh, and fluidity on opposite Darius Slay. Isn't shy about coming up and defending the run. Very well-rounded prospect, and I think that he would be a seamless plug-and-play option from day one and would rectify that perpetual cornerback conundrum that the Eagles have seemingly every season. Uh, one la- Two more. I got because people would say, Andrew, no linebacker. You say linebacker round two, Christian Harris, Alabama at 51. And, and I'm hoping that that would be tremendous if Harris was there at 51. Uh, so uh, that's where you think they'll go linebacker. Yeah, and, you know, you could obviously make the case for Devin Lloyd in the first round. But the way I viewed it is, you know, the corner was the higher priority. I think you can still get a starting caliber player with the traits that the Eagles really need in Christian Harris at the top of round two someone who is that rangy, athletic, spe- uh, coverage acumen specialist type of linebacker that can cover these hybrid tight ends and, and running backs. And um, every team needs one. You start to see the league trend in that direction, and I think that he gives them a three-down linebacker that can sort of be that that sideline-to-sideline side athletic guy that they really need that can uh, occupy a, a matchup to cover a Rob Gronkowski or a Travis Kelsey. I think he can be that guy. Last one. You have uh, in the seventh round a gentleman named Smoke Monday. What a great name! Yeah, you know Auburn <laughs> Auburn safety six three one ninety nine, long guy, rangy guy. I think that right now he's someone that is going to be. He thrives around the line of scrimmage, right? He's a really aggressive run defender, downhill player. Could stand to use a little bit more refinement in his coverage aspect, but I think he can be a rotational safety that can play the role of like a Marcus F something like what he did this year. But I do think that he would be a, a core special teams member from day one and a player that would be great value. If you can find him in the seventh round, which, you know, and all likely, I mean, you never want to say, Oh, he's never going to be available there. Yeah. That, that's what the, the whole pre-draft process is about. It's the pro- prospects rise and they fall throughout the whole thing. So it'll be interesting to see how, Smoke Monday is able to uh, help his draft stock or, you know, if he's able to sort of be that one of those day three sleepers. Just a great name. So we figured we had to talk that. If you want to look at Andrew's full mock draft, all seven rounds of the Eagles, check out InsideTheBirds.com. Follow him on Twitter at A. DiCecco NFL. And, of course, he'll be back on Tuesdays. We'll take a look at Super Bowl and uh, look back at the games from Championship Weekend. Andrew, enjoy the final real weekend of football. Will do. You do the same.